Well, welcome everybody and good morning. For those of you that are with us for the first time, we want you to know that we are living more deeply into what it means to live a generous life. Now, it would be a mistake to think that that's just a con to get people to give more money to the church. And there's a cynic in all of us that says, well, what's this all about? Is, is this really just a, a big sort of front to get people to give more money to the church? And the answer is, it's not. We believe that generosity, generosity of money, generosity of time that we give, generosity that we give through a generous spirit to others is the foundation of the Christian life. The absolute foundation of the Christian life. And that the world's well-being, our well-being, our family's well-being, our community's well-being, rises and falls on the degree to which we are living generously. And so we couldn't think of a more important thing to think about this year and every year to come. See, this is not going to go away, I'm sorry to tell you. It's not going to go away. We're going to talk about it in the winter. We're going to talk about it in the spring. We're going to talk about it next year. We're going to talk about it all the time. Because we think that it is not only something that we're called to do for other people, but we believe that generosity is the way that we express our devotion to God. It's the way that we live with God, and God comes to live in us. And what a beautiful thing it is when we can get to a place in our lives, and whatever that looks like, to live a generative life, to find ways to give in this world that not only are a blessing to other people, but, but truly bless us and make us realize how blessed we are to be alive and to be a part of God's ministry. So generosity is a journey. It's a journey as we, as we take hold of this concept and as we think about how it integrates into our time, our talent, and our treasure. So if you're just getting started on this journey, welcome, relax, um, take it all in. If you're at a place where you're, you're trying to live more deeply into it, welcome, uh, relax, let's, let's figure out where the tensions and the struggles are as we think about what it means to ge be generous. And if you've been on the journey for a while, relax, thank you, and let's pray together about the holy work that God is calling us to do because there's so much work to be done. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a, it's a challenge and, and also a privilege to try to figure out how to introduce to you Walter Brueggemann. The simple way of trying to do that is to say that there are very few people that have had a greater impact on the Christian family and the church, primarily through it, the formation of clergy and lay leaders, than Walter Brueggemann. He's the author of over 58 books. He is an Old Testament scholar who was first formed at Elmhurst College and Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis University. He's the son of a minister of the German Evangelical Synod of North America, and he himself was ordained into the Church of Christ, the United Church of Christ. He's been a professor since 1961 in served most recently as a professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary where he retired in the 2000s. He currently resides in Cincinnati and continues to write books that challenge us to move deeply into Scripture. And not just to read Scripture, but to allow Scripture to interpret our lives. 
as we seek to live out our faith. Some of his most recent books include An Unsettling God, Awed by Heaven, Rooted in the Earth, The Book That Breathes New Life, Scriptural Authority and the Biblical Theology, Hope Without History, Prayers for a Privileged People, Mandate to Difference, An Invitation to the Contemporary Church, Journey to the Common Good, and more recently, Money and Possessions, Resources for the Use of Scripture in the Church. Please join me in welcoming to Christ Church, Walter Brueggemann. Well, I want to try first to talk to you as a pastor, because we know you as an Old Testament professor and a, and a prophet in many ways. But I want to ask you first as a pastor, as a pastor who cares for people and their struggles. We believe in God. We do our best to come to church. We do our best to be good people and to love people and to follow Jesus. But when it comes to following Jesus with our wallets, it is really hard. Now, why is it so hard to follow Jesus with our wallets, with our money, with our possessions? Yep. I think, uh, and it is hard, uh, it's hard for me. I think it's because we live in a society that has taught us uh, that you don't have enough yet and that there's not enough to go around. That is, the, the dominant narrative of our society is a narrative of scarcity. And if we believe that uh, goods and resources are scarce, then we want to get all we can, and we don't want to give any up. And I think that the hard work of Christian faith is to recognize that the scarcity narrative is false, even though it is so powerful among us. Uh, it is false because God the Creator is endlessly giving an abundant life. I noticed in the opening hymn that we sang uh, this morning, the, the first, I think that the first line said that God has filled the earth with food. I thought, wow, here we are all affirming that. But then this other narrative crowds in on us and talks us out of that kind of affirmation. And I think that that's the struggle of our life to find out whether the <coughs> narrative of scarcity or the narrative of God's abundance is an adequate narrative for our life. And I think this whole journey of generosity is processing uh, that question mm -hmm. for us. Well, if God is going to provide, can I afford him my mortgage payment? <laughs> can I give him my college tuition bill? Can I get him to pay the medical bills? I mean, I hear what you're saying about there is enough, yep. but I think you're right. We have these pressures in our lives of how we're going to pay for things. Yeah. And then there is this fear of the next economic downturn. That's right. And the next uh, whatever, yep. you know, series of layoffs. How in the midst of uh, all of this fear that we have and all of this pressure, can we possibly believe that God is good and will provide for us? Yeah. I think that the secret code word is neighbor. That, that the kingdom of God is a vision of a neighborhood. And what you know about a neighborhood mm -hmm. is that if you have a trouble, a neighbor will pick it up and will sustain you. That's what a neighborhood is. Mm -hmm. But the, the narrative of scarcity wants us to believe in uh, radical individualism that there's no one that I can trust, no one that I can count on, no one to whom I am obligated, there's only me. And if there's only me, then the narrative of abundance doesn't work. It has to do with all of us trusting each other and sharing with each other, and neighbors 
neighborhood has resources that I myself uh, can't muster. And what happens to us, I think, is that the, the more we grow self-sufficient by ourselves, the less the neighborhood stays on our horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very difficult once we become uh, property and possessive and self-reliant and self-sufficient to imagine that the neighborhood has resources that I myself do not have to muster. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really do think that the, the, the whole vision of neighbor, uh, and, and I think that's Jesus, one of Jesus' primary questions about who's the neighbor, mm -hmm. or where's the neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, rela deeply related to the question of generosity. Mm -hmm. It's a question of uh, toward whom can I be generous, but it's also a question about who is being generous toward me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Jesus uh, tells that dreadful story about the man who tore down his barns and built bigger barns, he had no neighbors. Mm. Uh, he lived alone and he died alone, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Well, this is a part of the narrative because we don't live in neighborhoods like we used to. We live in a transient world. We live in a world where, where some of us have family members around us and some of us don't. Yeah, some right. of us have families scattered around the world because we've, we've lived in different places. We move with jobs and some of us have no family at all. That's right. And so we're faced sometimes with sort of looking down the barrel of what might be coming or what we're feeling at a particular moment. Yeah. And then there's a part of us that says, I don't want to have to have any neighbors. Back to this self-reliant thing. That's if right. I'm really a man or a woman, if I'm really successful, then I shouldn't need any help. I should be able to the kind of person I can provide for myself, and it's shameful if I ever have to receive any yeah. help. And, and, I and, I, think, and I've experienced that myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think the Christian narrative says that's a lie. You, you cannot finally live alone you cannot finally sustain your own life, but you depend on the resources of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the more and the sooner that we recognize that, uh, the better we will be about this whole crisis of scarcity because neighborhoods have resources uh, to which I can contribute and from which I can receive. And I think that the church, the local congregation, uh, at its best is a modeling out of neighborliness and of neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, and that means that the church uh, can't just be a, a, a drop-in service, but it's got to be a community uh, from whom we receive our life and to whom we give our life back in, uh, in missional mm -hmm. responsiveness. Well, this is a very different approach than I'm an attender or I go and I check the box, or I take my kids and I drop them off, or I come a little bit, a little bit there, but I'm not, I'm just sort of not really in. To, to move to a place of covenant, of thicker covenant, of thicker relationships bound up in the, the baptismal vows, That's right. seems to me to be the hope and the ideal. But it pushes us, though, to say that, that, that great question that the scripture asks, who is my neighbor? How do you answer that? How does, how does Scripture answer that question? Who is my neighbor? It seems to me that we're about extending the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I suppose you could say that the Scripture gives many answers, but basically it is either, uh, script, the scriptural answer is either my neighbor is the one in need or my neighbor is the one who shows mercy. So my neighbor is the one who is engaged in this process of giving and receiving with me and with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that the, 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 the ideology of scarcity wants me not to receive anything and not to give anything, but to live in a silo. And what we know, we know economically, we know emotionally and psychologically that living in a silo is a death sentence. You can do it a while, but you can't do it. Uh, and, and that is why uh, baptism is not a, 
is not a private deal between me and Jesus, but baptism is signing on with the community. The other day I had a, uh, I had a conversation with a mother whose son was playing soccer on Sunday morning. And so the whole family went to soccer on Sunday morning. And I asked her about that, and she said, well, he has to go. He's a member of the team. And I wasn't quick-witted enough to say, well, if he's baptized, he's been a member of this team a long time before the soccer team was organized. Mm -hmm. So we are members of the team. Mm -hmm. And being members of the team means to show up for practice and be there on game day and so on and so on. Uh, but, but we've got a, a, a very, uh, I think we have a very anemic understanding of the church uh, in which uh, membership uh, really means showing up and being on the team and contributing to the team effort uh, when it's inconvenient. So uh, baptismal faith seems to me to be highly inconvenient. Mm-hmm. And I, I always think about myself that I'm willing to die for Christ, but I don't want to be inconvenienced. And that's kind of... <laughs> well, say something to us about uh, the journey um, that, that we're called to How do we move from this scarcity thinking to this understanding of enough? Uh, How do we know when we have enough? Uh, What does enough mean? Well, uh, the notion of having enough is uh, rooted in the grace of God, which is limitless and unconditional, which means my worth is already established in God's goodness and my worth does not depend on uh, succeeding or achieving or possessing or consuming more. So God's grace, uh, when when I really can be situated in it, Uh, overcomes my restlessness about having to hustle more to establish my self-worth. But what Christian faith knows is that that gnawing power of inadequacy, uh, which I suppose you'd say is the work of the devil or something uh, out beyond us, is not the truth of our life. The truth of our life is that God's love has established our worth and it does not need to be enhanced. Mm. So what I need are uh, sufficient resources uh, to live with dignity and security and well-being But that's exactly the same that all my neighbors need, is dignity, security, and well-being. And uh, when I think that I need more and more, that leads me not to notice what my neighbor's need is. So I think the secret, I think the secret is that it's all a gift. Uh, In, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says to that church, what do you have that you have not been given? And of course, Paul means to say, you don't have anything that you haven't been given. It's all a gift to you. And the, the, more, the more successful we are, the more we get seduced into thinking that it's not a gift, but it's an achievement. Mm-hmm. And our achievements talk us out of it being a gift. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have to disagree with you there. Okay. Because, you know, I went to college. I went to graduate school. I've worked my head off. I've earned every bit of money that I've ever made. 
And it isn't God's money. Your life is it's just like mine. It's my money, okay? <laughs> it's my money. Yep. It's not God's money. That's right. God wasn't in the office last week, yep. okay? God hadn't been traveling yep. around the world. You know, God hadn't been, you know, yep. having insomnia. Yeah. Yep. All right? So why is it Well, God? I think God, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why? Christian, the Christian life says that our degrees and our occupational success and our money are all responses to God's gifts. None of those things that you have done and that I have done add a cubit to our worth because our worth is already settled. Now, if I think that's all a possession, that leads me to self-congratulations. If I think it's all a gift, that leads me to gratitude. Mm. And gratitude is the ground of generosity. Self-achievement goes like this. Gratitude goes like this. So one of the, one of the good disciplines for generosity is to practice physically, bodily, doing this, go like this, go like this, go like that. It's, it's, it's limitless. And I often think, I don't always think, but I often think at the Eucharist that we're the only community in the history of the world whose primary sacramental symbol is called thanks. Because you know the word Eucharist is the Greek word for thanks. So Eucharist is an incredible acknowledgement. It's all gift. It's all gift. And more gifts are being given. And I can share the gifts that have been given to me because more gifts are being given to me. Now that's so dead set against the narrative of scarcity. And I think that most of us are spending our life trying to decide how much we can go like this instead of like this. I think. So the abundance of God, how is that measured? How is that experienced, the abundance of God? What do you mean by the abundance of God that we're called to practice and live out in our lives? I think it is, I think biblically it's grounded in creation. That, that, that the world is indeed God's creation that God has made fruitful. Uh, so already in Genesis 1 he said, be fruitful, be fruitful, and he blessed it and, and all of that. And the, the great doxological psalms uh, are... Uh, exuberant, almost inexpressible awe at the fact that the world overflows with the goodness of God. Now, what we can see, if you believe in something like global warming, what you can see is that our greed has uh, caused the earth to shrivel in its productiveness in terms of the way we've wasted and exploited and abused the gift-giving processes of creation. But you know these, these texts well. In Psalm 145, it, it's, a, it's a psalm we often use for a, a table blessing. The eyes of all wait upon you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Now, we have to decide whether that's true, mm -hmm. but when we get together, we baptize people, that's what we say we believe. Mm -hmm. the, the, the stewardship question about the earth then is how can we, how can we protect and enhance the abundant processes of creation mm -hmm. 
rather than crippling them and disabling them. Well, I think, I think. that that's a, a, a really powerful external example, uh, whether you believe in global warming or not. It's irrefutable that the way that we have treated the Earth, the way that we have you know, d destroyed the Earth and, and its resources, all we have to do is to look at the Amazon and see how much we lose and how the, the Amazon is the heart and lungs of the Earth. And so the destruction of, of, of the Amazon, the destruction uh, of parts of North Carolina, every state, it's, it's a visible example right. of the sacrament of the earth and how we destroyed it. But what I'm struck by is how we have to decide as Christians whether we're going to participate in the destruction of humanity or the recreation of humanity. And I think that the... the the world that we often find ourselves living in seems to be divided by our sense of mission. That if we, as Christians, if we believe that we're called to participate with God in the transformation of the earth, the transformation of, of, our, of our city, of our communities, uh, of our world, then we, that we have to possess that mindset. But so often... Our mindset is not a Christian mission mindset. And so there's no link to generosity. The mindset is, how do I live in this world and possess more? That's right. How do I own more? How do I get more? And as a result of that, as we say in our confession, we, we pray for that which we have done and left undone. That's right. And I, I wish you, I would love to you, for you to comment on that. As, as we look at the, the Judeo-Christian experience, those episodes, when they were turned in on themselves right. and what happened, and those moments when God transformed their hearts and they became co-creators yep. in the recreation of the world. Yeah. Well, you can, you can, I think the, the book of Acts is a, a story of the struggle of the earliest church. And in um, Acts 5, there is this story of Ananias and Sapphira who withheld goods fr from the common good of the Christian community. And, and the text is very terse. It says they died. They died because they tried to hold out on the common good. Contrast that with Acts 4, in which Peter and John are on their way to the temple, and uh, they meet this, uh, I think he's blind or he's a, he's a beggar, and Peter says, he asks for alms, and Peter says, we don't have any gold, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. So, so the the earliest church is portrayed as having no material resources but having the juices of healing life. And it may be, if you, if you look at Acts 4 and Acts 5 back to back, that what those narratives are suggesting is that the more the early Jesus community tried to gather property for itself, the less it had transformative power in the world. So the logic of that is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big either or for the church or for any one of us uh, to pursue uh, the worth that the world thinks is worthy or this Easter power that makes new life possible. And I think that, that those narratives lay out those choices mm -hmm. in, in really quite radical fashion. Well, they're very different narratives, aren't they? The individual good or the common good. That's right. The individual good that I choose to focus upon for my good or the good of my family, because that is, in my own narrative, the most important thing. And therefore, I work very hard and I do my best to provide for my family. Yeah. But my provisions often go far beyond what my family actually needs right. and move very directly into what their wants are. That's right. Which is where perhaps the excess could be repurposed. That's right. 
toward the common good. That's right. So what is the what is the biblical vision? I mean, say something about the biblical. You have you've written a book called The Journey to the Common Good. How do we take the journey to the common good as Christians? Well, I think the, the common good in the Bible is the conviction that all of the neighbors, all of the neighbors are entitled to a life, to a viable life of dignity and security. All of the neighbors. And uh, that means that the, the big generosity question in my life is in what ways and to what extent can I be contributing to the well-being of the neighborhood in the conviction that when the neighborhood prospers, my life is better off. Hmm. And that's common sense. If, 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 if the neighborhood is not filled with greed and fear and violence and crime, that da, 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 I'm better off. I cannot build walls of privatism high enough to make me safe and cut me off from the reality of the neighborhood. So it, it is really a long-term pragmatism to be saying that my investments in the common good of the neighborhood are in fact an act of self-interest, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, which of course we never read, uh, the, 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 uh, I the, just finished reading it, by well, the way. No, bless you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bless you. But, but the, book, the book of Deuteronomy is the, is the interpretation of the Ten Commandments toward the common good. That, that's what Moses is doing in that book. And the centerpiece of that, as you know very well, is debt cancellation. Because the economy of scarcity creates a tension between debtors and creditors to where debtors will never pay their debts. That, that's the economy we're not caught in. Those debts are never going to be paid. And what Moses says about debt cancellation, he says, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. Mm. And, I, and I think that that little mosaic verse uh, wants to say that the, the posture of being anti-neighborly or against the common good is to be hard-hearted and tight-fisted. Mm. And it seems to me the whole narrative of the gospel is have a different kind of heart and a different kind of hand mm. than hard-hearted and tight-fisted. Say something about the Tenth Commandment. What is the Tenth Commandment? Uh, the Tenth Commandment, you, you mean we had a, we had a legislator in uh, Georgia who wanted to put the Ten Commandments everywhere, and some journalist asked him if he knew the Ten Commandments. <laughs> he said, well, I know there's one in there about adultery. That's all he knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Tenth Commandment is thou shalt not covet. What does it mean to covet? It means to want stuff that belongs to other people. And what's interesting about that terse little commandment is it uses the word neighbor three times. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, that's patriarchy. Uh, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And but what if you do that on the way to church on Sunday? I mean, that's well, very... you need to come and confess your coveting, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that commandment is aimed against an acquisitive society whereby the big ones eat the little ones. And I have tried to make the argument that, that the Ten Commandments are, uh, you, you know the Ten Commandments begin, I am the Lord thy God who brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Ten Commandments are to protect us from the practices of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh in the, in the Bible is a metaphor for greedy acquisitiveness. So the purpose of the Ten Commandments is do not act like Pharaoh. Do not act in 
greedy acquisitives do not think that it's right to get more at the expense of your neighbor. Uh, and I think it's uh, hugely important that that's the tenth commandment. It is the, it is the point of accent for the whole thing, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it matches, the, the tenth commandment matches the first two commandments, uh, thou shalt not have no other gods, and thou shalt have no graven images, which means thou shalt not worship gold things. So the commandments start with God instead of gold and end with neighbor instead of coveting. And if I can take one more step, at the center of the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath. The Sabbath means to take a break from the greedy restlessness of the acquisitive economy, mm. which in our society, I suspect, means to get electronically disconnected, <laughs> which is one mode of staying on track. <laughs> well, it's a powerful thought, Sabbath, because we really don't uh, take Sabbath. But as we think about taking a deeper step in our generosity journey, we need to have Sabbath, to rest, to pray, and to reflect on the blessings that we have. Give us an example as we think about taking a deeper journey in generosity. Without being sort of formulaic, what would be a way that we could sit down with ourselves, with our family members, and engage a Sabbath First, a Sabbath. Second, to have a conversation with God in which we ask God to take us into a reflection on the tensions and the contradictions in our lives. And to take that humanity and transform it. Yeah. Because we are human. And, and that's the thing. I said, I don't, I don't think shame and guilt around generosity are very helpful at all. Oh, they're not. They're not. And, um, and sometimes our, our, our tight-fistedness uh, or, and I'm not kidding, you know, driving to church and seeing other people's homes or, or you know, arriving at church and looking at on Facebook or Instagram and seeing people's vacations and various things like that. You know, we, we live in a culture that promotes covetousness. That's right. You know, our right. whole, all of our technology promotes the idea that uh, look, at, look at what I don't have. That's right. Look what I need, what I need to have. Yeah. You know, and these are very real pressures for us. Uh, soon we'll be moving into Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yep. And at Christmas time, we absolutely need to make up for all the mistakes we've made by being as ridiculously generous as we can to show and demonstrate our love to our loved ones, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so we're in this cycle, Walter. You know, we're in this cycle, we're in this culture, and it's not just about greed, it's really about the human heart. That's great. It's about how our heart is possessed and, and captive yep. to cycles and culture. And it's so hard to break, Walter. It is. It's so hard to break when our children come to us, and, and, and come in some cases grandchildren, and their wants are not wants, but they are, they, I mean, their needs are not needs, but, they're, but are often right. are wants that far exceed anything that any of us could ever have imagined having as children. That's okay? right. So... We're bound up, and we need a Sabbath. Right. So what is that Sabbath? What might that Sabbath look like? And what might that journey of transformation look like to be freed from the captivity that we find ourselves yeah. in? And I don't, I don't think I know the answer to that, but I, I'll try to make well, a response. Well, thank you for coming today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I, I think that uh, people who are as uh, successful as we all are are always getting and taking initiatives. And Sabbath is to break that cycle to be on the receiving end, not the initiative, but the receiving end of God's gifts. I think uh, among the ingredients for that is a stillness in the day, a capacity to count blessings, to count blessings with our children and grandchildren. And if, you, if we do that regularly, our awareness grows of the range of blessings that have come to us. It includes food that Jews know ought to be prepared the day before, to include people in the food that you do not count as your normal friends. And I think it includes overt acts of generosity to say to the children and the grandchildren, what overt act of generosity shall we commit together today? Mm. Now, that might be picking up trash on the highway. It, it might be many things. Now I'm going to say something inflammatory. The NFL now has the slogan, we own Sunday. <laughs> and the NFL, excepting your team, <laughs> is a liturgy of money, violence, and sex. That's what the NFL is. I think given that phenomenon in our society, Sabbath means disengaging from that because money, sex, and violence are not a helpful way for us to count our blessings when it's predatory. So I think quite dramatically and visibly and concretely, that's, a, that's an interesting question for us to struggle with. Mm -hmm. that, that if we're going to keep Sabbath, it really means to be inconvenienced to stop doing some things we readily and easily like to do because our children and grandchildren need to see us regularly and physically not having our lives propelled by more initiative taking. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Well, I don't find that easy. Well, I, know, I understand, and I'm going to respectfully disagree with you about All the right. NFL. Uh, because, and I, and I understand what you're, what you're saying, and I think that there, there is imagery and, and there are issues uh, that, that need to be explored uh, around violence and, and you know, the, the self-aggrandizement. But what my dream is, is that people come to church before they go to the Panthers game. That'd be good. Okay. That'd be good. And, and that, you know, and that if they're going to go to a football game, you know, I think that can actually be a great experience for the family together to spend some time and connect or even watching it at home. And I, and I think actually, you know, whether it's NFL or um, college football, Roll Tide, uh, you know, it can be, um, uh, easy now, easy. Okay. I think, I think that, uh, I guess what I'm saying is, um, I feel like it's not necessarily sometimes the things, but what we, how we decide to understand them. Agreed. Okay. And, and if, if the NFL, um, if Sunday, if football on Sunday, or or tennis on Sunday, or soccer on Sunday, or whatever, um, 
begins to supplant our Christianity, if it begins to supplant, uh, and I do think football on Sunday is the largest liturgy without question on Sunday. And I think that is something that's worth naming and being aware of. But I don't know if they're mutually exclusive. Uh, but I think the real question is, what has gotten captive of our heart? I think that's right. You know, yep. it, it, if, if something, anything, it seems to me, that we, and I think this is where we can agree, anything that supplants our relationship with God, whether that's football, whether that's video games, whether that's work, yep. whether that's shopping, that's where we're going to really get controversy. That's right. Okay. That is idolatry. That's right. And I, I suppose I mention NFL instead of shopping because uh, I'm not attracted to shopping. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but I think, I think, you know, one of the things that we do in Sabbath is we're invited to think about what our idols are. That's right, that's right. What are the idols, what are the things that have taken hold of us? Yeah. And so we're given this opportunity to repent. What does it mean to repent? Uh, it, it means to go the other way. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the way we've been talking, it means to, um, to uh, give up that narrative of scarcity and greed and put our buckets down in a narrative of gift and gratitude. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, in, in our economy, I think that's the work of our life. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy work. Mm -hmm. But it is such liberating work. I love the idea of um, a different way I love the idea of a different way being a better way, yeah. a better way, that, that we need to name the idols in our lives, we need to name the, the things that possess us, uh, the temptations, the, the culture, but perhaps with prayer, with Sabbath, with taking a deeper journey in generosity, we can find a better way. And I love this idea of what you said of what is an overt Thing that I can do to be generous. And I, and I want to just, you know, as we sort of wrap this up this morning um, and continue the conversation, I'd like to invite you to do what Walter has just suggested, and that's to create a space in, our, in your life, in our lives, uh, for Sabbath, for prayer for contemplation, to realize that we're human and that it's, we're created human. And part of the human experience is living with this struggle, with these struggles. But through Sabbath and prayer, we can find a better way. We can find a more generous way to live a life of generosity and mission and service to Christ in all the contexts of life that we live in. And it seems to me that this is the Christian life. And it isn't an easy life, as you say. No. Um, I, I, I would love to say that I would die for Jesus, but I don't want to be inconvenienced. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. I may use that. You know how you do that. You say, Walter Brueggemann once said, then the second time you say, I heard it said, and then you say, well, I've always said it. That's right. So, uh, so uh, <laughs> we'll look for that to That's come. That's right. As we prepare to leave today, Walter, you have blessed us with such incredible uh, prophetic engagement around some of the, the struggles that we have as human beings and as Christians. And would you pray for us that we might have the courage to create the space to listen to God and to take a deeper journey and generosity. Sure I will. The Lord be with you. Awesome. Right. We pray for your spirit to lead us into deeper honesty about who we are, 
and who we want to be, that we may engage in true struggle for a better future. But after you have given us the gift of honesty, give us the gift of wonder that we may be filled with wonder and awe at how great you are, how good you are, how generous you are, how caring and providing you are. And we are on the receiving end of your great good generosity. Give us the courage and the freedom to resituate our lives in the territory of gift and neighbor and gratitude that we may give up the deep rat race that dwells deep among us that we do not need to run that race because you have provided us with a more excellent way. So we pray for your transforming spirit, for your exuberant generosity that runs past all our needs and all our wants and all our desires. And grant that as time goes on, we give ourselves over to the truth of your goodness, that we may become those whom you have intended us to be. We give you thanks that we have been sealed as your own forever. Grant that the truth of our baptism may grow deeper and deeper in our daily practice. We pray in the name of Jesus, who was the fleshly revelation of your generosity. Amen. Amen. Thank you.